Lisa Gavoyan is a third generation Fresno County person, um, lives in the family residence. She tells me the grapes are down, rolled, and notwithstanding our need for rain, Lisa would suggest that maybe just it could hold off for a few more days. Fresno State graduate, attended Hastings College of the Law after some um, forays into the civil area in which she was trying to find her way, I think was the words you said. She latched on to the Fresno County District Attorney's Office and for the past 25 years has done just about everything there is to do uh, in that office. She has been from 2007 to 2013 the Assistant District Attorney. She currently runs the, as a direct supervisor for the Homicide Division. Uh, she has, as I say, done just about everything there is to do uh, within that uh, office, which is a panoply of things, criminal, civil, civil uh, dealing with appellate issues, et cetera. Uh, Rachel Hill, for the past 24 years, has uh, developed experience in both civil and criminal law. She spent uh, time in Corin Barstow and then 10 years at the Fresno County District Attorney's Office, where she was a prosecutor, uh, criminal law specialist certification. Uh, she um, had some time doing defense and then civil work with Bennett and Sharp and another firm. Uh, she's taught uh, constitutional law and related issues at San Joaquin Law School, and she's a Notre Dame graduate. Bill McEwen came to Fresno in 1966, been with the B for 19, for, since 1980. Now, you, he has received national, regional awards in every category you can imagine, uh, from breaking news, investigatory reporting, columns, which he was a stellar columnist. You don't hear as much about his bicycle riding anymore, just once in, a, once in a great while. He does say that he's won um, every award except the one that counts the Pulitzer, but we know you have some more in you, Bill. So thank you very much for agreeing to moderate today. This is not an easy task. He is kind of the moderator in chief, and he is for this cycle. If you've seen him in action, he spends a lot of time to make it look easy. So with that, Bill, it's all yours. And our timer is Gary Renner. No, I had the coat off because I didn't want to be like Richard Nixon and totally sweating before I came up here. <laughs> Going a long way back. And also, uh, a couple years ago, maybe about five years ago, J Jim Bourne and I came here and we did a live podcast. And that was uh, the latest thing, you know, of uh, the digital age. And uh, now podcasts aren't that popular because people want everything instantly. And uh, so we're being uh, live streamed right now on FresnoB.com. So anyone that calls up FresnoB.com can see what's going on here. And uh, the fine people from uh, Community Media Access Collaborative, they're headquartered in the old B building, the old MET building. Uh, they're producing today's telecast and uh, it will be uh, broadcast, I'm sure, several times on uh, on uh, Comcast community channels. So uh, people have access to see both candidates through uh, free media, and we think that's a very good thing. Also, I would like to uh, plug a new thing that we've done in the B. And again, candidates say, well, I'm running a gas grassroots campaign. I can't raise big money. How do we get the message out? In the primary, you might have noticed that we had E the people, and that we invited candidates to put up their biography, put up their picture, and also uh, a answer the basic questions about their race. And uh, we put it up, and at first, you know, it wasn't getting that much traction. And in the newspaper business, we count everything today, every click. And uh, by the time the primary was over, we had more than 110,000 visits to that site. And in the last three or four days, it was spectacular, uh, the number of people. So the turnout was very low in the primary election, but uh, we feel that uh, people had the opportunity to make informed decisions. Yeah, that's the one. OK, and uh, this is for the candidate's uh, uh, benefit. Let's hold up that 15 sign. 
There you go, 15 seconds. That means uh, wrap it up, and of course, I'll let you complete your sentence, but please don't uh, ab abuse that privilege and go on and on. Also, if you're asked a question and either candidate brings up a new point, uh, the other candidate will get an opportunity to respond. If uh, they go on the attack a little bit, again, I'll provide the opportunity to respond. We did a, a judicial, a judge's uh, forum in the primary at Fresno State, and uh, that didn't happen early, but later in the forum, uh, we had a lot of rebutting going on and having to keep track of a lot of time. Because this is on television and the Rotary wanted a fast, crisp format, most of the answers are uh, designated for 60 seconds, so the candidates have to get in there, make their point, and get out. And um, so also it's designed so that Everybody has an equal number of opportunities to be the first responder and the second responder. Uh, sometimes if you don't devise the forum or the debate in a fair way, it'll seem like one candidate's always getting the last word, and so we don't want to do that. The goal today is to have a very uh, fair forum and uh, let each candidate uh, speak their mind. And uh, each has a microphone, and uh, we're going to get it going with an introduction, 90 seconds each. Did you hear that, Mr. Timekeeper? 90 seconds. And uh, we'll start with uh, Rachel Hill's introduction of herself. Let's see if I have this right. Can everyone hear me? No. Okay. I think I'll have to hold it. Okay. Um, my name is Rachel Hill. Thank you so much for having me here. I uh, Just to give you a little background about myself, I started my education at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, where I was inducted into the Sigma Beta Honor Society. And then uh, I spent a year and a half of my undergraduate studies studying overseas. I uh, studied English and comparative legal uh, uh, systems in London. And then I was admitted to a year-long program at the Sorbonne. When I returned and finished my undergraduate studies. I uh, worked in New York for a couple of years trying to save money so that I could attend law school. And I attended the University of Notre Dame where I worked on the law journal. I was recruited on campus in 1989 by the firm of McCormick, Barstow, Shepard, Waite, and Carruth. And I moved, I've moved here and I've lived here ever since. And I practiced for five years in complex business litigation. I handled cases involving CEQA regulations, ERISA issues, probate issues, contract disputes, construction defect litigation, any number of, of, um, of business disputes. I was anxious to do trial work. I moved on to the district attorney's office where I spent 10 years, and I was on uh, numerous uh, felony trial teams. I've done defense work. I was recruited by the law school to teach criminal law and to develop a juvenile justice program, which I'm extremely passionate about. And um, I think I've developed the well-rounded experience so that I could provide a fair and just resolution to disputes in our county. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Lisa Gamoyan, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity for both candidates to address all of you. Um, I hope we answer some of your questions. Um, as Judge Oliver said, um, I'm as Fresno as you can get. Both sides of my family, three generations back, have all farmed in Fresno County. Um, I still live on and operate the family farm with my mom. Uh, I'm a product of local public schools, Selma High School, Fresno State. The only time I've been away from home is to attend Hastings Law School in San Francisco. I always knew I wanted to return home, and I did. I practiced in the civil arena for five years. I did insurance defense work, a little bit of transactional work, municipal law, eminent domain law, and a lot of land use work. In 1999, I decided to go to the district attorney's office, um, and it's been a whirlwind. I can't believe 25 years later has, it's passed so quickly. Um, I came up the usual way in the DA's office, um, juvenile, misdemeanors, general felonies. I was asked to go to the sexual assault team where the higher octane type lawyers, the type A's, go. Um, I was successful there and proved my proficiency. And in 1995, I interviewed and got a job uh, at Homicide where I have primarily practiced. I was promoted to senior, chief of homicide, assistant district attorney, the number three, 
and I oversee all homicide cases in the office. Uh, to date, I've tried over 100 cases to a jury. 31 are, have been murder cases. Three of those are death penalty cases, and I have additionally seven life without possibility of parole commitments. Uh, Lisa, we're going to end it right Thank there. You. Thank you. But you get to uh, go first on the next question, which is describe a situation in which you had to do something difficult or make a very tough decision that might have been very unpopular. And uh, we're going to allow 90 seconds on this one. Thank you. Me first, Bill? Did yes. Um, those are decisions I make on a daily basis, very difficult decisions. Um, there's a lot of pressure when homicide detectives have been investigating a case where someone has been murdered. That case is brought over to the district attorney's office after they have made an arrest. And it's my job to review all the evidence and determine what evidence is going to be admissible and whether or not I believe that this case can be proved to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. And oftentimes, that is not the case, that I don't believe we could meet our burden, and I turn down a case for filing, which means that someone is going to be released from the jail who has taken a human life. Um, there's a lot of explaining I have to do. Um, it's not, as I said, a popular decision. It's not the easy decision, but it's the right decision, and it's the type of decision-making I do on a daily basis. Likewise, um, when I determine that a case, uh, there's an appropriate case uh, to go forward with the death penalty, those are things that were staffed with the district attorney. I make a recommendation, and ultimately it's up to me to go through the trial process and argue to a jury to authorize the, exec the execution, the taking of a human life. Um, those are difficult decisions but they're the right decisions, and I'm capable of making those decisions and have done so for over 25 years. And uh, thank you for that. Uh, Rachel, I'll uh, give the question again. You've got a lot of experience in uh, the judicial world. Describe a situation in which you had to do something difficult or make a tough decision, even though it might have been unpopular. And again, 90 seconds. Uh, well, much like Lisa, I have um, had any number of cases where they've been submitted for filing. I did do uh, filing and, and, um, and in initiated cases in the district attorney's office, and I did have to turn a number down, and that was always a difficult decision when you didn't feel that the burden had been met. But I believe you were asking for a specific instance. I can tell you there was one that's, that stands out uh, right now, and that is a jury trial that I did. It was a, um, a strong-arm robbery, two to two co-defendants, and during the course of the jury trial, some new evidence came out that I didn't have possession of. There were police reports due to a snafu in the, in the police department. There were some uh, police reports that I didn't have, but I was charged with having, and I didn't have it. And that evidence came out during the jury trial uh, at the very last minute. The jury deliberated, they came back hung, and then uh, they were asked to continue to deliberate. They came back guilty. While they were deliberating, frankly, I was also deliberating. And I was very concerned that perhaps we got it wrong because there was more evidence that came out that we didn't know about. And I, um, I spoke to the defense attorneys, and I suggested that they bring a motion for new trial. And um, I said that I would not oppose it, and I felt that the judge would likely grant it. So that's exactly what happened. It undid the verdict um, it, based on the judge's assessment as well. And um, it enabled me to sleep at night because I wasn't incarcerating somebody for something they didn't do. Thank you. And uh, Judge Oliver tells me that the audience uh, would like the candidates to stand when they give their answers. So certainly you can sit and take notes, but when you're giving your answer, uh, the audience would like you to stand. They want to see more of you. So uh, with this one, uh, we're going to stay with uh, Rachel Hill. And uh, Rachel, you made it through the primary. Now you're in the general election final. Uh, what do you like or dislike about campaigning? And in a perfect world, should judges stand for election or should they be appointed? Well, I suppose the politically correct thing to say since I'm standing for election is they should stand for election. But um, this actually has been a very eye-opening process. Um, 
I am actually honored to have met the people that I have. It's a fascinating process. Uh, it is a tiring process. It is something that does concern me. I do think that the appointment process, although fraught with some difficulties of its own, it is inherently secretive. There are a lot of things you, you, uh, you can't know about. You can't affirmatively really campaign for it. I am concerned that with judicial elections that they're so far down ticket that people uh, don't have the opportunity to learn much about us. In fact, pre-primary, I did go to some media outlets to ask if they would consider candidate forums, and they said simply they, they didn't think they'd get the ratings, that it wouldn't be entertaining enough. So I do think there are problems with both processes, but the, it is a process and that I'm grateful for that you've given us the opportunity here to have a forum so that you can understand what it is that we're trying to accomplish and why we think we would serve you best. Thank you. And uh, I'll give the question again for... Uh, Lisa Gamoyan. Lisa, what do you like or, or dislike about campaigning in a perfect world? Should judges stand for election or should they be appointed? And uh, this one is 60 seconds. Thank you. Um, what I've really enjoyed about the process is actually getting out and talking to the citizens that I've been serving over the past 25 years and actually um, having them affirm that um, my work has been important, that contributing to public safety is their number one concern, and my concern, we have that in common. Um, I'm uncomfortable with the political process. I'm not a person who likes to talk about myself. I'm more the person who likes to roll up my sleeves and get the job done. Um, so that's a little bit hard that it's, so, it's been kind of a combination of, of, of the two, and I'm more comfortable with the, the doing of the work, digging in and get, getting the job done. Um, I've never gone through the appointment process, so I have nothing to compare it to. Um, this is the first time that I've actually sought a judicial pos position. Um, I, I like the electoral process. I mean, it's the only time where the citizens for whom we're all gonna be working for have a voice in who their next sitting judge is. Thank you for that. And uh, Lisa, you'll be up uh, again in our format, two in a row. And uh, this one, we'll see if we'll make the candidates uh, sweat a little bit. Question gets a little tougher. For Lisa Gamoyan, uh, what are you telling people who opine that Fresno County already has too many former prosecutors on its superior court bench? And uh, answer on this one is uh, 60 seconds. Um, what I say is that prosecutors are committed to public safety, first and foremost. Um, that additionally, prosecutors are in the courtroom day in and day out, and, and who better to know how the judicial system works? Um, likewise, we all take an oath when we become prosecutors. Um, we take an oath when we become judges, and it's not all that difficult to switch hats. Um, as a prosecutor, your first and foremost concern is public safety, uh, making sure you represent the people as a judge. Um, you basically are sworn to the same responsibility, that is public safety, and providing all litigants a fair and impartial forum over which you oversee to make sure the attorneys, the parties comport themselves, follow the evidence code, and respond and act appropriately. And uh, a little different question for uh, Rachel Hill, and I know you've answered it before in the campaign, Rachel, but what are you telling people who opine that uh, Fresno County Superior Court bench shouldn't have two judges from the same household? And uh, 60 seconds for your answer. Well, um, there already are family members on the bench, and there have been family members on the bench before. There are, are brothers that have been on the bench. There's a brother and sister-in-law on the bench. My husband and I have uh, worked quite well together in the past. We both worked in the district attorney's office. However, um, when you are on the bench, you are in your own courtroom. You are not uh, next, next to each other. You're not conferring with each other on a regular basis. You're handling your own calendar, and that's plenty. We're independent individuals. Individuals. We're both passionate about the justice system. We, I think part of our attraction to each other was the fact that we're passionate about the justice system. And so um, we're both driven to this calling, and for us it is a calling, and I don't think there's anything inappropriate about that. Thank you, and um, stay right up, okay. or what, if you want to take notes. Uh, and uh, this question came up, and you both dealt with this during the primary, and. 
I think the audience will see a contrast of in their answers here, perhaps. I don't want to speak for them, but uh, Rachel, you said during the primary that jail overcrowding and early inmate releases are affecting the courts. They're affecting the uh, public safety of Fresno County. With the election of a new district attorney, do you see the potential to reduce the problem, and what part can the judiciary play? And uh, this requires uh, some thought and a uh, two-minute two answer on this one. Thank you. Um, actually, I do think that the district attorney does play a vital role in jail overcrowding because uh, they're the first uh, they're, they're the first person, the first entity that takes a look at the cases and decides whether they should make it on to the judicial system. So certainly the district attorney plays a significant role in that. And I think that our incoming district attorney will do an excellent job at that. Um, the role that judges play and can play in jail overcrowding is somewhat circumstantial. However, I would take the lead from some uh, some creative judges right now, Hillary Chittick, uh, Judge Alvarez, Judge Gabe, Judge Conklin, who have implemented certain procedures to speed up the process, which opens up jail bed space, including uh, deeming the complaint the information that saves 14 days of jail bed space. So that's, um, that's dramatically impacted uh, the jail bed space. They've reduced the average number of inmates that are released. Last year it was 55 per day, now it's down to 32. Early case resolution, looking at alternatives to incarceration for people that are not a threat to the community. There are pretrial services, there's SCRAM, which is, is a, a monitoring system that has a GPS and also can detect alcohol in someone's system. So there are any number of things that can be done to speed up the process. Thank you. And uh, now we'll uh, turn to Lisa Gamoyan. And uh, Lisa, you said during the primary that jail overcrowding and early inmate releases are affecting the courts, affecting uh, public safety in Fresno County in a, negative way, in a negative way. With the election of the new DA, do you see the potential to uh, reduce the problem? And what part, what part can the judges play in this? Um, I do always see a potential whenever a new district attorney administration is coming in. This will be the third district attorney that um, I may be working under come January. I don't know. <laughs> that remains to be seen. Um, I, to me, jail overcrowding is, at this time, um, really is the biggest threat to our community, our safety, the sanctity of our property. And there are things that the courts can do. Um, the lowest numbers I've seen as far as um, early releases are 40 a day, not 32. On average, they're about 50 to 60 a day. That's a lot. That means those individuals, those criminals, are being released to return to the neighborhoods and, and streets that we share with them. Um, there are many things that we can do. Um, reducing um, the number of, of days for arraignment, um, that certainly is a good start, and it's a good effort by the court, but the fact of the matter remains, the problem is the continuances that occur. There's a culture in the courthouse. Everyone seems to believe that they're overworked. There's not enough attorneys, defense attorneys, prosecutors, and, and I, I personally do not believe that's the case. But cases on average take far too long to get to trial. 75% of the jail population today is pending disposition. They have not gone to judgment. They're awaiting trial. And that tells me we have to speed up the time within which we dispose of those cases. Either they enter a plea or they go to jury. Um, certainly in some of the home courts that I've seen, Judge Sanderson, Judge Capitan, everyone knew, all the lawyers in those departments knew that those two judges would not tolerate continuances and they moved their calendar. What the judges have to do in the home court is hold the attorney's feet to the fire. Make them show good cause for a continuance. And if they show good cause and continue the matter, set it to a date certain when they know they'll be ready to proceed. Rather than wasting court time, attorney time, bailiff time, transporting the prisoner back two weeks later for another continuance to occur. Uh, additionally, I think it's, it's important to note that um, the conflicts defense uh, firm at Mr. Chumo's office and his second tier um, as well. With respects to homicide cases I'm speaking about, because I'm familiar mostly with those, um, we do most of our trials with Chumo's office. Um, and up to July, we were doing um, maybe nine cases 
nine jury trial cases. Four of them were with Chumo's office. One was with the t second tier defense attorney's office. Only one of them was with the public defender's office and one was pro per. So that tells me we have to find more expedient ways to move the cases and there is a limited amount okay, of taxpayer. Okay, we're going we're gonna to end it right oh. there. Two minutes is up, and uh, we'll give you about 20 seconds, 30 seconds to rebut before we go, go to the next question. And I would like you to address culture of continuance. Yes, well, um, the problem is it sounds good to say hold the attorney's feet to the fire, make them prepared. There is the Sixth Amendment Law Institute that is currently investigating Fresno County because the Fresno public defenders have on average four times the felony cases that they should have by national standards. So when a judge has a defense attorney that comes into their courtroom and says, Your Honor, of the 50 cases I have on calendar today, I couldn't meet them all in the jail yesterday. And if the judge forced them to proceed and go forward, and let's say the prosecutor got their conviction, it would be overturned on appeal for ineffective assistance of counsel. That would be a monumental waste of time and resources. It simply isn't, it isn't realistic. We need to fund the court system because this is important work that's being done there. This is people's lives that we're dealing with. And so uh, to say that people aren't working hard enough is, I think, simply being blind to the reality. I know okay. I've worked in both well, offices. Uh, Thank let's, you. Let's end it right there. Lisa Gamoyan, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yes, I do. Of the 50 to 60 people that are early released today, at least one third, 25% to 33% of those cases that go to the DA's office of those new arrestees will be turned down for filing. They will never have contact with the court system for that particular case again. And of those that are early released and cited out, they're given court dates to return. Seven, 60 to 70% of those individuals do not return to court. So I'm wondering where the big um, caseload is coming from. It's coming from all the cases that continue. No one is pushing their cases. All that many new cases are not being assigned. And furthermore, we need to examine what Mr. Chuma is doing in his office, because his attorneys likewise have a very high caseload, and they're able to cycle their cases faster. Thank you. And uh, so now, uh, and let's see here. Lisa Gamoyan, you're up still, and uh, this is a layman's question. Am I allowed a layman's question? You know, something from the headlines, something that just drives me crazy. So uh, 90 seconds for this, and the basic question is, how will you run your courtroom? But I would like you to address, uh, I don't know, can you address the Harry Baker case in a hypothetical? I'm not sure it's a hypothetical anymore. Right. Well, my question is, as a layman, uh, the case has been in the headlines for seven years, and not only have we not passed go, I don't think we're past Mediterranean Avenue yet. <laughs> Let me just speak to, to matters that continue forever. And, okay. And 90 if seconds. If I can do that. Um, it's very frustrating. Um, certainly, um, the quality of a case never improves with the passage of time. I think all of us in the court system, prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, and the system in general, I think we lose our credibility when cases continue and continue, get reset and continue. I know witnesses and victims in cases I've handled, um, when I send them you know, the sixth subpoena, they don't even call in, they don't want to talk about it, they don't believe the case is ever going to go. Um, it takes some initiative in the current state of the courthouse to push a case through. Um, it amazes me how many continuances are agreed to by both sides when full well knowing that one side is going to be prejudiced by a simple aging of a case. Um, I am not going to make a nine-year-old rape victim wait years before that case is litigated. And consequently, you have to push. You have to be aggressive. And you don't make a lot of judges happy when you are aggressive and when you are not agreeable. It is an adversarial system. Each side is sworn with the responsibility of representing the interests of their client. And it's the judge's job to arbitrate. Um, and that's what I would do as a judge, certainly as a prosecutor. It's what I do day in and day out, and that is push my cases forward. If there's a good reason for a continuance, I may agree to it. 
But otherwise, I'm not going to let my victims and my witnesses um, hang fire for years and years and years. It interrupts their lives and, and their victims and witnesses. Thank you. And uh, Rachel Hill, just again, uh, how would you run your courtroom and, and how would you deal with uh, timeliness in regards to uh, justice? Well, I'm used to dealing with very heavy calendars. I've been in home courts where I myself have had to, both from the defense perspective as well as the prosecution perspective, had to handle high volume calendars. I can tell you my husband's calendar right now, he's in a home court and he handles on average 120 felonies per day. That's a lot of cases that are coming through. And so to say that the, that the system isn't overburdened and that the attorneys aren't overworked is simply not looking at the reality of it. I do agree with Ms. Gamoyan regarding the fact that if you delay a case, it only makes it worse. Well, if you try a case, get your conviction that was improperly pushed forward, and it gets overturned for ineffective assistance on appeal, then you have to retry it two years down the road when that victim, that nine-year-old victim is now 11, has to testify again, be traumatized again, and probably doesn't have the same memory. So I think getting it right and doing it right the first time is our first defense. Thank you. And uh, now, uh, for you, Rachel Hill, if you had uh, 90 seconds of Governor Brown's undivided attention, see, it's gonna be a 90 second answer. What would you tell them about AB 109 inmate realignment, the implement, of it in Fresno County? Well, I would tell them with respect to the implementation, since I should not, as a judicial candidate, be opining on specific pieces of legislation, but what I can say is that in terms of the implementation, you can't properly properly implement it unless you properly fund it. And Fresno County hasn't been getting the amount of funding that it needs in order to properly in, uh, implement it. We have all of these people who would otherwise be in state prisons being sent here to our local jails and they're overcrowded and we simply cannot handle that. And we're not gonna be able to build prisons fast enough to, to keep that going. So the fact is there has to be an understanding on the part of the state that if you are going to institute these rules, you have to give the local governments the, the resources in order to handle uh, the changes in the law. Thank you. And uh, Lisa Gamoyan. Thank you. And this is just an ABO, AB 109 question. Yeah, if you had 90 seconds with the governor, what would you tell him? Where would I start? My gosh, there's so many things. With regards to AB 109, um, thanks for the warning, Governor. It would have been nice um, if you would have funded some new jail space um, before you sent all our prisoners back and refused to take the, the new committees. Um, that's the main problem. That certainly has exasperated our situation at the jail. Um, it is not the sole reason that we have early re releases, however. Um, it would have been nice, as I said, to have been consulted and rather than it be a unilateral decision from the governor's office for all of us at the table with the stake to have participated in that process. Thank you. And uh, another question for you, Lisa. Maybe I ought to check with uh, Judge Levy or Judge Hill on whether they can answer that this one or not. Um, Anyway, the Fresno Editorial Board has on more than one occasion said that Governor Brown should appoint a sentencing commission to make sentencing of convicted criminals consistent, proportionate, and keeping with available tax money used to incarcerate felons. felons. We pointed out uh, a number of states that have done this, including southern law and order states. They've uh, gone to uh, sentencing restructuring. So my question for you, here's a setup, is uh, the B editorial board as dumb as a post? Or is there logic to taking a fresh look at sentencing in California? And 90 seconds on this one. Thank you. Um, I think, frankly, the last thing we need is another commission. I think we are overwrought with condition, commissions and new departments. I think we just need to get down to brass tacks and, and do our jobs that we're all sworn to do. Um, if it's a statewide commission, um, there are different aspects and different communities within the state that feel differently about crime. And certainly, you can't, you can't make broad, broad brush strokes with respects to particular criminals. 
because every crime is different, every criminal is different, how it affects the community, how it affects the, the victim, it's all different. And it is incumbent on a judge to individually weigh every single case that comes before he or she, um, to take into account the effect on the victim, uh, the defendant's prior criminal history, who he is, what he's gone through in his life, weighing the aggravating and mitigating circumstances. And only a, an individual sitting judge could do that, not a commission. Thank you. And uh, so I'll uh, repeat uh, the condensed version. Uh, is the uh, be as dumb as a post on asking for sentencing uh, commission to look at uh, sentencing in California? Actually, I think it's an excellent idea, and I have some experience with this because I worked in the federal system where there is a federal sentencing commission, and they do very good work, and one of the things that they've moved toward is something called evidence-based sentencing. It just makes common sense. It, what evidence-based sentencing is, is looking at the statistics that they've gathered over the years, and as you know, the federal government keeps a lot of data on all of us, uh, and including criminal behavior, and some of it, uh, some of the data they use for good, that they compile, and they know now what works, what types of crimes are best suited to long-term drug treatment, for instance, versus incarceration. They know the recidivism rates. They know where it inures to public safety and benefit, and we can save some money. So I think that it makes sense to look at the statistics, know what the data is, so you're not just looking at ad hoc anecdotal evidence. You have the real evidence before you. And one thing the Sentencing Commission has done is they have done exactly what my opponent um, has, has indicated she would like to see, which is give some more discretion back to the judges so that they are looking at a case-by-case -case basis and all the mitigating, aggravating circumstances, criminal history, et cetera. But it's not doing it in a vacuum. It's doing it with more information about what actually works to protect our communities. Thank you. And uh, now we're coming to the end. And I know in the primary, a lot of people were saying, oh, all these judges sound pretty much the same. They give the same answers. I think today you saw some uh, sharp contrasts. And uh, we're going to have our closing statements now. And uh, we're going to lengthen it a little, because we started early. So you'll have 90 seconds. and. Uh, Let's see, Rachel had the first word today, so that means that Lisa's going to have the last word. Now you're going to have the last word. And uh, Rachel, uh, tell us why people should vote for you in 90 seconds. Well, um, be honestly, it isn't about me. It's not my, about my opponent personally. It's about who is best suited to do the job of looking after the community and representing the justice system and being the face of the justice system. You, you impact so many people's lives on a regular basis and in a profound way, whether you're in a civil court dealing with business disputes, whether you're dealing with family disputes, uh, whether you're dealing with criminal issues. And it's, it's a place where it needs to be a passion of yours. It needs to be something where you've developed the skill set over the years. And you come from not a, a, a biased perspective, where you have the, um, the opportunity to see things from different perspectives, to gather in the evidence from an unbiased perspective and make a fair and just resolution so that the community is protected, so that people's businesses are protected, their homes are protected, and that justice is served. And it doesn't devolve into vigilante justice. It is actually justice with mercy, but with a view toward public safety. Thank you. And Elisa Gamoyan, tell the audience what uh, you're telling the voter at the door on why they uh, should vote for you. Um, a superior court judge, and I'm sorry to say this, Judge Levy, but um, they actually have a lot of power, maybe even more than an appellate judge, in that a superior court judge is going to be exercising discretion and can only be reversed for an abuse of discretion. So the question is, who do you trust to exercise discretion. And I would submit to you that um, I would be that person. Um, I best reflect this community. Um, I live and breathe Fresno County. Uh, I've been here and committed myself to this county my entire life. I've committed my entire life to public safety. Um, and that would be first and foremost um, in my courtroom that would determine Public safety would drive and determine my decisions. Um, I would be fair, um, that, that would be my job, impartial. 
I, I would provide a forum for all who come before me. But again, as I said, whose discretion do you trust to weigh the evidence, to evaluate the evidence, to interpret the law? And I would submit to you that the people who have endorsed me that have said they trust my discretion, the Fresno Police Officers Association, the Deputy Sheriff's Association, Sheriff Mims, my coworkers, the Fresno County prosecutors, the Fresno County district attorney investigators, it's my discretion they trust. I've earned that and I want to continue to work for all of you. Thank you. Thank you and uh, let's have a hand for both candidates. It's not easy putting yourself out, out there and running for political office. Uh, it takes uh, some courage and you have to rally uh, those around you to uh, mount an effective campaign and uh, we have two outstanding candidates here. Thank you.